And uh, probably like myself, you all probably have some worn out fibrum somewhere. And even if you don't, what's really exciting is uh, Luke and Tyler are here to really talk not just about the brand, but about this idea of footwear and how we responsibly can keep it alive. And that goes back to the quality of the build as well as the construction. And what's most exciting, these guys just kind of live, eat, and breathe, resoling. And if you haven't already seen the Vibram uh, van, the repair van and trailer are over at TSC uh, patio, and we're actually going to break. So we're going to go maybe half time in here today, and then we're going to all kind of march in mass over and see the operation. So these guys have uh, traveled a long way to come and share about Vibram or Vibram if we wanted to really be true to our Italian roots. Yeah, yeah, we'll talk about that Pretty for sure. Awesome. Yeah. So let's uh, give a big warm welcome. Cool. Thanks, guys. <laughs> So we're not sure how the, the mic thing's gonna work. We're gonna like try and just be right next to each other. We sure. get along pretty well. But let us know if you can't hear us. And um, basically we're gonna go over a quick intro of um, our personal stories. We'll talk about Vibram uh, or Vibram. I'll get to that in a second. Uh, Luke works out of this place called the Gear Fix in Bend. So just kind of a, a couple um, questions we have. Raise your hand if you've heard of Vibram, Vibram, seen the logo uh, just out in the world. So the majority of you, right? We love that. Um, so we're an 80-year-old brand. We're going to talk about the, the history of the brand and everything. And um, Luke's been working out of the gear fix. He can talk about uh, his intro as well. Uh, do you want to go with your intro and sure. just with like your, your personal mm -hmm. gear fix and everything? So uh, the gear fix started about 12 years ago as an outdoor gear consignment store. So we were trading and selling used uh, gear. Uh, basically, people of the town would come in and trade it in, you know, stuff that had been sitting in their closet or the garage. Uh, we'd sell it. Uh, with it being used, you find that certain things need to be spiffed up, repaired, this and that, for it to go back out and, you know, have an adventure again. So uh, our company started off doing bikes and ski repair. Um, that's more generally known. Uh, a few years later, about six years ago we bought a shoe shop you know we had a good year we had a crazy idea to buy a shoe repair shop we loaded it all up in a truck drove it over the mountains and set it up um, I was crazy enough to volunteer myself to learn that trade because <laughs> it's a pretty obscure thing these days but uh, I think it's gaining traction especially with the uh, the notion of repair reuse and recycling um, with reselling and repairing gear, uh, it definitely keeps good products that might need a, you know, this or that to keep it going out of the landfill and on to another adventure. So that's kind of our goal as a company. Um, about a year after we started the shoe repair shop, we added a sewing repair shop. So we work on outerwear, tents, sleeping bags, as well as technical outdoor footwear, Birkenstocks. Uh, my background, is basically climbing shoes, hiking boots, chacos. Um, so that's what we do uh, in general. Um, in order to feed my need for knowledge, uh, I took some intensive courses in shoemaking, pattern making, and the likes. Uh, so it's been a pretty interesting and fun adventure. Um, and people seem to be excited about it whenever I show it off. So. <laughs> Amen. Um. So I, I graduated in 2011 from a university in Rhode Island and uh, immediately got a job with Vibram. I speak Spanish, that was my, my in. I, they were looking for a Spanish speaking customer service rep for, uh, for Five Fingers specifically. I guess I'll ask that again, uh, or another question. Raise your hand if you've ever heard or worn Five Fingers or any of the products we make. So not as, not as well known as the company itself, um, but I've been with the company for a little over seven years, hopped around to different positions, sales, marketing, things like that. If you, uh, if you all have questions about footwear in general, specific to Vibram or not, I might not have that exact answer, but I can figure it out for you afterwards. So feel free as we, uh, as we break and go out to the van to ask whatever questions you want about footwear in general or about you know, our experiences in, in, in general. I guess we'll move on. So, uh, Vitali Bramani, this is our owner, uh, our founder. Uh, in the 1930s, uh, he was a, a mountaineer guide in the Italian Alps, and one of his expeditions, he took 10 people up, 
and on the way down, six people slipped, fell, and died. Uh, they attributed a lot of this lack of traction to the fact that it was leather soles with nails through them, things like that, so technology really hadn't caught up yet. And so out of this tragedy, Vitaly was inspired to make a, uh, a better uh, outsole for mountaineering boots. So he hooked up with Pirelli tires, if you've heard of them, out of Italy, uh, and took some of their rubber, vulcanized rubber, and made the first uh, mountaineering sole uh, for, uh, for hiking boots. So Vitaly's our, our founder. His grandson is actually our current CEO uh, over in Italy. His name was Marco. And so you've heard me say Vitaly. The name Vibram comes from V-I, uh, from Vitaly, and the B-R-A-M for Bermani. So the Italians say Vibram. A lot of the Americans uh, that we have in the company say Vibram. If you ask Marco, who is, it's his grandfather who started the company, uh, how you say it, how we should pronounce it and everything, he'll basically flip over his shoe, ask you if you recognize the yellow logo, you say yes, and he says, I don't care how you say it. <laughs> um, so that's the true, that's the true story, um, you know, based out of tragedy, but it's been a family business this whole time. It's an 80-year-old company. Um, our original soul, which we'll so show you outside, uh, we forgot to bring it in, is called the Caramato. It stands for uh, Tank Tire Tread, and it's one of the most copied uh, patents in the world, one of the most popular patents, so you'll see that outside. It's still one of our most popular uh, souls. This kind of uh, emulates like it. This. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, this with a heel. Yeah. So instead of it being flat, that lug pattern is kind of our original sole. Uh, so yeah, still family business. Like I said, 80 years old, and for the first 70 years, uh, all we did was make soles. So we make everything for the military, uh, including other allies' military that we work with. Uh, we work with over a thousand brands uh, worldwide. So we have quite a bit of experience in making soles. Uh, we can talk more about that if you guys have questions. We, we describe it as baking a cake is kind of how we uh, look at the different formulas that go into the rubber compounds and things like that, how the rubber is produced, um, different additives, and, and so on and so forth. We make about 50 different compounds currently, and we'll talk a bit more about the top two once we're out at the van and you guys can hold and feel the different compounds that we're talking about. So celebrating our 80th uh, anniversary, this was the, this was the um, kind of campaign that we went with. So this is the sole that we were referring to called the car motto. And uh, we do everything from uh, sandals to climbing shoes to military boots, um, motocross boots. You name it, we've probably worked with it at some point, uh, which is pretty cool. So the Vibram, Vibram soles, the Vibram name, have been a part of hundreds of different categories and uh, shoes and things like that. So who remembers, I know you're a bit younger than us, but who remembers when Five Fingers came out around 2005, 2006? Decent amount. Um, so the whole minimalist movement uh, was kind of uh, gaining uh, speed at that point with a book called Born to Run by Christopher McDougall, if you guys have heard of that. It's a really cool story uh, about the Tyramar Indians and um, basically folks that are, that are running barefoot all over the world to this day super efficiently. It's not their diet. They drink tons of beer. They do all this stuff, but they are running barefoot and being as efficient as possible. So there was a design student in Italy in the early 2000s. His name is Robert Fleary. He's still our head designer. Uh, this was a, uh, basically a design project uh, in university. So he was a, kind of a hippie crunchy, is kind of a hippie crunchy guy going up and down the mountain every day. And he would go up in his big boots. And on the way down, he would go barefoot because that's what he really liked uh, to feel. But his feet would get cut up. So he, he kind of, uh, this is our first original uh, model with five fingers called the classic. And it was basically just a, a second skin covering, making sure that you had uh, protection for your bare feet, but to have a you know, five toe articulated shoe uh, to mimic that barefoot style. So Robert actually brought this idea to Vibram and the same way we made soles for every other you know, brand that's out there, he said, you guys should totally pitch this to you know, the other companies uh, that are out there and, and make, the sh make the sole for them. Uh, we pitched this idea. I wasn't around for this, but we pitched this idea at the time to a bunch of different companies uh, about this whole new minimalist trend that we were going to we want to be a part of. And uh, they basically said no, that they didn't want to do it. It was all about cushion. It was all about support. And uh, so our, our, the, the grandson of our founder, Marco, decided this is going to be our first complete shoe that we ever made. So 70 years into the company being around, we finally made our first shoe. And that's, uh, that's Five and Five Fingers. This is definitely more of my background. 
the minimalist movement, um, working in customer service and sales and marketing with this type of stuff for, uh, for the better part of six or seven years. Uh, if you guys have questions on that, uh, especially as we go outside, uh, happy to elaborate on anything. So now comes the Soul Factor program. The Soul Factor program is basically this idea that you can send your shoes in and get them resold. Cobblers have existed for, uh, for a long time, obviously, uh, but we're trying to kind of revamp that energy of don't throw your favorite shoes away in the landfill, get them resold, uh, add traction or grip or durability to an existing pair that you have that really just doesn't have that, uh, the performance quality on the bottom. So we're in our second full year of the tour, uh, going around the country with two vehicles. You'll see our Sprinter van out there with a trailer attached. Uh, it's about 32 feet long, and then we have a 40-foot RV um, that's a little bit more uh, impressive, I would say. Uh, but we basically go around the country. This is our first university visit, so thanks for being our, our kind of guinea pig here, as Chase might say. Uh, happy to be the guinea pig here, right? Um, so we're, we're, we're basically trying to revamp this industry and say, we're not, tr we're not trying to be the, the resole, the end all be all of resoling. You know, the Vibram isn't going to be resoling your shoes, but we're going around talking to folks like yourself uh, to spread the word, the green message of keeping your shoes out of landfill, upgrading your shoes, and um, that's why we're here. So we'll see all that stuff outside. Uh, but we, the reason that we're kind of connected with Luke is uh, Luke not being with Vibram. He, uh, he offers us a lot as a cobbler. Uh, and we work with guest cobblers all the time. So we basically drive around the country. If we're in Minnesota, we ha call all the, the cobblers in Minnesota and say, who wants to work with us? Um, and Luke happened to be a really great partner uh, out of Bend, Oregon, uh, specifically with climbing shoes. And so we just went to Moab, Utah for a climbing event. We invited Luke and I said, we have this chance to speak to students two days later in Logan, would you wanna come? And so that's how uh, we got connected. So now uh, I'm going to hand this over to Luke. Uh, all the pictures I'm trying to get, you know, show Luke working on the, on the vehicle. So this is actually Luke inside the van on the left. And uh, he's basically going to, you know, start talking about the art of resoling shoes, um, stitching versus gluing, uh, what you're looking in a sole, what you're looking for in a sole, whether it be grip, traction, durability, uh, tread versus compound, and things like that. Right on. So uh, anyone ever had... Shoes resold before, yeah. Climbing shoes, hiking boots, tacos, that kind of thing. Yeah. Stuff you spend a little bit more money on. Oh, yeah. on you <laughs> that better? <laughs> uh, so, uh, typically, shoes were constructed um, with leather, leather soles stitched together. Um, eventually the advent of modern adhesives kind of made it possible to have a lot more options and rubber um, as well. So um, designs improved for specific purposes um, and the shoes were a little bit easier to put together now because uh, it just it mostly all glue. Um, some of your nicer, more expensive pairs of shoes would be st stitched in some way still, uh, makes them a little bit more repairable. Um, you see a lot today of molded soles, um, molded mid soles, that kind of thing. Um, and you can see here, this is basically us grinding down a boot to put a new sole on. Um, you can see that stitch line in there. So typically, you would take all that off, re-stitch a new one on. Um, with modern adhesives, you can kind of work around that depending on um, the condition of the shoe. Uh, Resoling gives you an opportunity to customize uh, your sole for your desired purpose of the shoe and also improves lifespan. Um, different soles have different lug designs depending on where they're designed to work well um, and different compounds for wear, durability, or traction. Um, you know, typically your more outdoor oriented shoes are going to be a combination of durability and traction. Uh, climbing shoes, for instance, are mostly about grip, not a lot of lug there. Um, so those tend to wear out a little bit quicker than normal, especially since you're using them in a, uh, such a rough environment, typically, you know. Um, you got any questions about that? Mm -hmm. Killing it. <laughs> actually, actually, yeah, man. Question. So with you grinding down uh, the shoe, would you then um, 
use adhesive to, to stick a new sole on, or would you Precisely. nail it on? Okay. Yeah. Certain instances, you'd run into nails and things like that, but most, most modern footwear is put together with adhesives. Um, you know, your classic red wing boots would still be uh, stitched on midsole. The outsole's still glued on, though. Um, so depending on the scope of work, um, yeah. This, depending on the scope of work, you know, stitching still may be involved to get the resole on. But basically, outside of fire boots, you know, wildland firefighting boots, uh, and men's dress shoes, uh, everything's glued. Yeah. The reason for wildland firefighting boots is the adhesives are heat activated, and that's throughout the entire um, industry. It takes a lot of heat, but if you're walking on smoldering ground, your sole could fall off, and then you're kind of in trouble. <laughs> uh, so here's a few different um, soles and different compounds. Um, this is called the Zagama. Those are different colors. That's in the Mega Grip compound. You can see it's kind of designed for a running shoe with that little toe rand bumper. Um, the flat, that could be adapted to, onto very many different shoes. Uh, it's popular to put it on a Birkenstock, things like that. And then the Christy Thick over there, that is what you'd find on a lot of um, classic heritage style work boots, like the Red Wing. You've seen that classic wedge sole. Um, and then down here we have the Arctic Grip compound. Uh, basically that is made to grip in wet ice. And if you haven't tried it, it's pretty, it's, it works very well. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> it's kind of um, wild. <laughs> so the reason we put just a few of these pictures up, we make hundreds of different soles, like I said, but um, we want to give a little bit of a rep representation between rubber-based soles and EVA-based soles. So the, the Christy Thick on the right is actually like a foam EVA-based sole. Uh, that's basically for lightness. If you have a heavy boot, you don't want it to be even heavier uh, while still being you know, durable with, the, with that EBA. Uh, Arctic Grip is our newest compound that we came out with two years ago. It is truly awesome. It's not, it's not meant to replace spikes if you're doing something really gnarly up in the mountains and things like that. Uh, but for a smooth, wet surface, I don't know how it is around here in the winter, but uh, any you know, sidewalks, stairs, driveways, all that stuff, when you have a smooth layer of ice, this Arctic Grip technology uh, grips really well. It's, it's, uh, it's awesome. By the way, we're passing some stuff around. Um, we have the sole, kind of the original uh, design patent. Uh, the iPass shoes, uh, you'll see that you have over there. Those are the other ones floating around, but those are actually my shoes that we resold uh, a couple of months ago. And then the other shoe that's floating around is a Chaco that we actually got this morning. We ripped the sole off and just took it in with us so you can see what it looks like um, not having the sole on there. And we'll have a bunch more stuff to show you outside, but just want to start passing some stuff around. Uh, the, the compound for the, the shoes that, that have been resold is called EcoStep. It's 40% uh, recycled, uh, post-industrial recycled rubber. So uh, you kind of check that out as well. So just real quick, on yeah. that recycled one, how does that do on like durability and grip? You, you sacrifice durability, for sure. Um, the, same, the same way that Luke was describing, you know, for climbing shoes or the stickier rubber. The stickier the rubber is, the, the less dur durable it is. Um, and the same thing when we, um, we don't put certain additives or, or things like that into the go step, um, you're, you're losing that durability. So it's very much like a fashion-oriented uh, style with, with that kind of green message. So... Oh, yeah. Yeah, so with the go step, do you have like a ecological adhesive as well, or is there? Not necessarily. Yeah, it'd be the same. We, we, use, the, yeah. we use the most eco-friendly stuff we can get um, for your, our body and for the environment. Uh, it's still pretty gnarly stuff, though. Right. <laughs> so in relation to the soles and designs of shoes, like, uh, you know, someone would bring a pair of shoes in, and um, you have to kind of deduce what sole would be appropriate. And obviously not every sole can go on any shoe. Um, and that's where it can be kind of creative. Um, also, different wear and uh, damage to the existing shoe can affect what is possible. Um, so that's, uh, you know, I get to see all of 
the designer's stuff years after it's been in use. And so uh, I get to tear it all apart and figure out how to put it all back together. So I have a fair amount of uh, knowledge on how shoes are, are made <laughs> just from having to do it. I'm about 10,000 pairs in at this point. So <laughs> see what we got next. So on that note, um, in order to better be able to repair shoes and also just to, to know this and that about how the things go together, this is some of my own work in design and making. Um, so you see here, this is an upper laid out before it's sewn. And then we have a sewn upper next to a last. You guys ever messed with lasts, seen all that kind of stuff? And then an almost finished shoe over there after lasting and soling. And another boot here. In this picture, we have various different hand tools that are used in like traditional hand -make, handmade shoes. And uh, you can see that boot's going together right there. That's a traditional English welt. Um, on that boot. You can see there a pattern standard right there that I've made. Um, you guys familiar with the pattern making of shoes? Anyone? Anyone touched on that yet? Probably next year. <laughs> a little early, yeah, yeah. And so basically you can see here in this one, this is a last that's been covered in tape. And that gives us the form of the shoe. You can actually just draw right on the tape, peel it off, stick it onto a piece of paper, and you can smooth things out mathematically, this and that, and start to make all your individual pieces. Um, this is a repair job I did for a friend where we replaced the whole front and bottom of the shoe, <laughs> just for fun. <laughs> so you can see here, this is the new vamp. This is an old vamp, and there's the old shaft of the boot. And this is another design that I made. <laughs> a few more things on that line. In seaming and welting, you can see the upper has been pulled over and tacked. And then I'm starting to go around and sew the welt on. And that's after the outsoles have been put on. Another example of a pattern standard. And then another finished shoe. <laughs> but uh, yeah. We wanted to keep this part <laughs> relatively, you know, condensed and, and short and sweet um, so that we could interact with you, with you all more either in here or as we walk out in that event. Um, any initial questions that you guys have about anything that we might have briefly covered or? What's the future for spray on or 3D printing with either original soles or cobblers being able to replace? In 3D printing? That's a good question. Yeah, I guess I, <laughs> I have seen a, a certain amount of um, 3D printed shoes being made where they can scan your foot and basically print it out. I think that the materials probably have to come a little bit further along uh, in the nature of durability. Um, it could be something in the future. Uh, the resoling industry is still kind of stuck in the past at the moment. Um, and you know, we're sticking to old ways, but there's constant innovation in design and, and all that kind of thing um, to make it more, more viable. Yeah, you definitely see it on the, on the R&D design side right now, but I think the materials would have to, you know, improve a little bit for 3D printing. So when you're designing a sole, the material compound is obviously important, but the actual tread pattern, what goes into the design of a tread pattern and the testing of a tread pattern? How do you decide if it works or doesn't work? Yeah. Um, so basically, uh, we'll, we'll get approached by one of our partners that we work with. It could be a New Balance or North Face, or et cetera, et cetera. And they'll be, they'll be looking to get something specific out of, the, uh, out of the sole. And so we have tester teams all over the world that, as we come out with prototypes, we make them for, you know, kind of in-house, resold them ourselves. And uh, we have tester teams that just basically put them, put them through, the, through the ringer uh, with <coughs> different grades, different surfaces, wet surface, dry surface, in the fields, in a controlled environment, all that stuff. Um, and then we, we basically put it next to uh, last version or whatever you had originally, so you can see the difference in a video, uh, things like that. Uh, our designers were, were originally scheduled to come here and would answer that question a lot more, you know, with uh, details and everything, and we can follow up with more of that uh, for sure. 
from what I have experienced with choosing different soles, a lot of it has to do with the environment you're using it in. Um, different soles are designed to shed mud or not hold onto rocks. Um, you know, that's where you get different patterns of lugs. Um, also, a little bit of it is art, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and creating a, you know, a, a, a product that would um, be singular to an indiv individual brand, you know. Um, there's obviously, most of the things on the Soul Factor line are open to any cobbler that could go on any shoe, whereas certain things that Vibram designs are specific to a brand. Um, and so they're looking for a little bit of art and also some functional design. Yeah. And, um, tread, the tread on the, on the sole is typically uh, more to do with traction that you're getting, and the compound would be more of grip um, or lack thereof, depending on what you're looking for in a, in a, uh, in a sole. Other questions? Yeah. How is the process of resoling a climbing shoe different than resoling a boot? So, a climbing shoe is kind of like a leather sock with rubber on the outside, so they typically don't have a whole lot of structure. Um, the way in which they wear is a lot different than a boot, too. On a boot, it's basically the bottom, you know. Obviously, certain things can happen to the upper of the boot, but a climbing shoe can wear in multiple different locations depending on how you're using it, you know. If you're a climber, you've heard the phrase toe dragger <laughs> or toe dragging, and so you can wear the rand out, you can wear the bottoms out, the sides out if you're doing a lot of crack climbing. Um, so basically when it comes to resoling a climbing shoe, there's an added aspect of the flexibility of the shoe, how closely it fits on a person's foot, and um, where the wear is specifically. And um, that adds a little bit of complexity. Um, when I resole shoes, we use lasts to give the shoe support while we work on it. When we fit the the shoe onto the last, we're looking for how that person has broken the shoe in. If you're a climber, you know that when you first get a climbing shoe, it can be a little bit of a torture device <laughs> until you've get it, got it broken in. So resoling basically um, helps you keep as much of that broken in fit as possible. And then if you're an avid climber, you know sometimes it could be two to four months before you're wearing out a pair of $180 shoes. Um, so it makes sense to be able to put new rubber on there, maybe customize it to the, in the type of rock you normally climb, um, that kind of thing. Um, I would say probably 75% of the shoes I resole I have to do toe caps on just because it becomes thin and you don't want to get out you know, on a weekend and blow out your shoe, climb on your toe, you know what I mean? <laughs> Although some people don't seem to mind. <laughs> Yep. Yeah, so from a, like a design aspect, are there certain things you can do that make it easier for a sole, like a shoe to be resold? Definitely. Um, and a design aspect, for the modern resoler, um, things that are really cut up sole-wise and shaped and have a lot of, you know, um, molded aspects to them, they can be a little bit more difficult to resole because mostly w with like a modern hiking boot or trail runner or, or things like that, there's a, the soles are made in a mold together and they just glue that whole thing to the bottom of the finished shoe. Um, whereas a shoe that has, um, you know, a welt and a midsole, it's a more in the two dimensional aspect. So you can just remove the sole and put a new sole on it. It's more of a traditional and expensive way to make shoes. Um, which is why typically your your <clears throat> main market of shoes is going to be Strobel construction, which is like a running shoe, and then um, with a unit sole just attached to the bottom. Now, being a cobbler, we have to get creative and work around those kind of things. So um, there are ways. Some things are a lot harder than others, though. <laughs> Answer your question? Cool. Yo, uh, okay. yeah, you guys decide. <laughs> uh, how long does it typically take you to resole a shoe? Sure. Uh, so, so the process has a lot to do with um, 
the curing of the glue. So we're always waiting on that to happen. Typically, we're not resoling one pair of shoes and then you're done for the day. So what will happen is you begin the day tearing shoes down, prepping soles, and gluing them up. After the glue sat and off-gassed its solvents, we'll reheat it because um, it's a heat-activated glue, apply the sole, and then press it on. Typically, from tear down to applying the sole, it's around an hour. And then after the sole is applied and been pressed, it's another about an hour, ideally, um, or more, to get to the finish stage, which would be trimming and uh, sanding, finish buffing, uh, to make it you know a seamless bond. And to uh, to give you an idea of what we do on the tour. Um, if we if we just had one pair that was dropped off, it'd be done in that hour and a half, two hour time frame. But what we do is just similar to this morning. We just took 17 pairs uh, between nine and 12, and instead of doing one one complete process at a time for each shoe, they'll basically remove all the soles, then they'll prime all the soles. So it's it's more of an assembly line. So when people come up to us and say, "How long is it going to take?" and we say, "You know, tomorrow afternoon you'll, you'll get them back," we have to explain that it's not just you know, the, as if we had one pair, basically. So it's a little bit different in the tour versus, you know, a cobbler shop. Um, so in climbing shoes, what is it in the sole that makes it so rigid that the shoe won't, so you grip the ball better? I don't know if that makes sense. You're talking about the shape of the toe, like you see a downturned shoe that <laughs> basically looks like a banana? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So what's so rigid? So there's a thermoplastic midsole or... Um, it's either thermoplastic or an impregnated, like, um, almost synthetic wool, in a way, um, that is moldable. And uh, when it's put on the last, when the, when the shoe is sewn and then put on the last, the last holds it in that shape. And then the layers of rubber and midsole are glued on an arc. And so it's a laminate, basically. And the laminate can hold that shape. Now, as you wear the shoe, it's going to break it down. So, you know, if you've had a shoe for four or five years, it's definitely not the same shape that it was when it was new. Um, but that's basically how that works. It's, it, it's putting layers of material in lamination. Um, and then you'll see the different rubbers that we have for climbing. So some of them, like grip, are a little bit more flexible, and some of them, like edge, are stiffer, which will help, you know, keep that, keep that form going. Is that there? So all your different shoes are different sizes, of course, that you're matching. Mm -hmm. What's the best way to put the um, outsole on and then cut it? What Depending on the sole, um, I mean, in, a, in a shop, there would basically, there's basically, a few of you have gotten the truck earlier, I think. Um, there's, there's a finishing machine, and it has several different implements for taking the sole back down to the edge of the shoe. Um, mostly it's sandpaper. Um, scotch bright wheel, wire wheels, um, and trimmer blades. Um, and as you guys walk through the, by the van, we can, we can poke, poke your head in or jump in and, and check that out. But um, I've seen people who are using benchtop grinders. I've even seen a guy who <laughs> had a, um, uh, one of those hand sanders that belt and uh, belt hand sander, and he basically C clamped it to his bench, and he was doing resoles out of a, out of the back of his van. Um, obviously, the be better the machine, the better the product, and the more you can do. But uh, um, you could also use sharp knives, depending on the sole. Like if it's too thick to run a knife through, you really like that one you had there, the rainbow. You could do that with a razor blade. Yeah. Yeah. Like in the market, in typical. So it's generally around fifty to seventy-five dollars, depending on the sole um, and where you're at in, in in the country. The majority of what you're paying for is the, is the service, is the uh, the man, you know, the labor. So the soles are relatively inexpensive to whatever you're paying for the resole, but the time that it takes the cobbler to to complete it is really what you're paying for. Wholesale cost, unlike the 
the rainbow sandal there sold would probably be around $12. Mm -hmm. Jurassic Park. That's a good question. Uh, it's hard to find. Uh, it's hard to find people willing to take new people on. Um, the, the shops have tended to start closing more and more as the years have gone on. Uh, I'm definitely one of the youngest guys in the group that I have been around. You know, um, you know, I go to the shoe repair trade shows, and a lot of times I'm the youngest guy by 20 years. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, Different communities respond better, you know, to, to that. So I know that you guys had a, a shoe repair shop in town that closed recently. Uh, you know, basically more people need to be taking it on, and there needs to be more willing people to train. Um, but if you are interested in that, I would say, you know, just look around and, and, and see. You know, obviously being in design school, you could maybe uh, start it yourself. That's how it kind of went for me. You know, we bought the machines, and I stayed up till one o'clock every night for two years, tinkering and teaching myself. <laughs> Have you noticed a difference, or are you aware of a difference over the last number of decades in the designs of shoes and the way that they're designed, knowing that there isn't as much resoling and there isn't as much repair now that um, initial designers expected to throw away and repurchase, whereas 75 years ago you were expected to fix and resold. Has that changed? It's starting to change, especially with the visibility of, like, for me in my shop, we're on the sales floor of our consignment shop. People watch us all day long. Uh, a lot of times you get, like, the, you know, the long stairs, and you're like, you need some help, and they're like, I just, I'm amazed that you can still do this. Um, generally with, like, Outdoor technical footwear, people are spending more money on it. Um, the designs are typically better and meant to be resold. Um, it just kind of depends. Um, I think that people are kind of starting to get over the cheap aspect of, of their things these days. It's starting to go back up and how can we reuse, how can we repair. Um, so um, hopefully the design, designers of the future uh, keep that in mind because it's good for everyone. <laughs> and, and keep in mind that, you know, every cobbler is different. Their equipment, their, their knowledge, their expertise. So while some shoes are really more cookie cutter on how you take the sole off, on how you reapply, uh, if you find the right cobbler, they can almost do anything, uh, depending on how much life is left in the shoe. But we're, one thing we're starting to do as a company is um, make the midsole uh, built into the sole and sell that as one unit. So that's kind of changing things too, where not as necessarily designed to be resold, but could definitely be resold by someone with the proper uh, experience. I tend to be a lot more brave than some of the elderly men that do this job, so. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. Uh, we should probably head out. Yeah, let's yeah. go. You want to go yeah. check it out? So let's go out. We'll head down to TSC Plaza.